Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. And to those who are listening online, thank you for coming. Just want to make a small correction. I uh, was the outreach administrator for a NOAA Cooperative Science Center that was at Howard University. So it's one of four in the country. This is for an educational partnership program that NOAA runs out of their Office of Education. And it's to increase um, diversity in the sciences and in NOAA's workforce. Um, so just so you know, it wasn't actually no, it was a funded cooperative science center, which um, has 13 institutional partners. So today I'd like to talk about building and maintaining partnerships with academia, geoscience organizations, and government agencies, creating sustainable pathways for interns. And this is actually an e-lightning poster that I presented at AGU in December in San Francisco. And this basically gives you an idea of what the program is, what our, who our partners are, and how these create pathways for interns to enter the geosciences arena and field. And before I start, I just want to say that we've had really good representation from HAO. We've had Sarah Gibson as a mentor. I don't know how long you've been a mentor, but you've been a mentor to a recent protege who actually just presented a, as a talk at AMS in Boston on uh, solar flux ropes. And then we also have another uh, HAO member. His name is Scott Sewell, who also had a student this past summer who worked on circuits with the CubeSats um, project with NASA. And then we also have another HAO member who's a steering committee member for SOARS, which helps in the selection and recommendations for each year's cohort, and that's Astrid Mati. Did I say your name right? Okay, thank you. So let me give you an overview of SOARS. Outside of the NCAR Mesa Lab at the end of the program for summer 2019 cohort, that cohort included 20 students, 12 of whom were returning protégés, meaning our program is not a one-off program. It's not like other REUs, which are research experiences for undergraduates. This program is multi-year, and students can participate for up to four summers that do not have to be consecutive. Um, of the 12 returning protégés, uh, eight were graduates. All eight are now doing PhD programs around the country, four in Colorado, uh, one at CSU in atmospheric sciences, one at CU in civil systems, and um, one, also another one at CSU in aerospace engineering, and another one at CU doing ocean interactions with her mentor, by the way, um, who is now her uh, PhD advisor. So her research mentor for her program, during the summers here at uh, SOARS uh, is now her PhD advisor. The other four are at Caltech, Brown, North Texas, and oh, Penn State, in, all in uh, atmospheric sciences except for one. So the program itself is leveraging collaborations and participations and partnerships in academia and government and geosciences. And this has been happening, as Paul said, for 23 years, since 1996 in the inception. This program was an unsolicited award from the director of NSF, as well as the director of UCAR, Rick Anthes, and that's how this program came into existence. The partnerships are clearly crucial for the internship opportunities, as well as for mentoring which remains the most, one of the most critical factors in successful outcomes for participation in undergraduate research, and that is across the board. Mentoring is extremely valued and um, necessary for, I think, the sciences to continue. We have a short clip. SOARS provides multi-year research experiences to historically underrepresented students in STEM. Many have worked to overcome educational or economic disadvantages that may present challenges in STEM careers. The 11-week SOARS internship experience pairs protégés with NCAR researchers, communication and computing mentors, personal coaches, and a wide community of alumni and peers. The experience culminates in an end-of-summer colloquium and poster session. 
This summer, 20 undergraduate interns from 15 universities conducted original research at UCAR and NCAR, the University of Colorado, and NOAA. This year, SOARS was recognized for its excellent work and mission in developing a diverse, internationally competitive, and globally engaged workforce. We received the 2019 STEM Mentoring and Making Award for Diversity and Inclusion Program of the Year. So that was exciting. I uh, went to receive the award in Cincinnati, and uh, I think that the country is recognizing, as what we already know, that we're trying to make a difference in um, the quality and level of research uh, and training for the students, and I think that that's something to be proud of. So for our academic partners, we partner with CU, Boulder, but also CU, but in different ways. Uh, they also provide research mentors like NCAR and UCAR do, do, but also some of the mentors are partners with NOAA, the lab, and CU. So they have a partnership called Ceres, which is a cooperative institute. At CSU, it's called CIRA, but here it's called Ceres. And they provide laboratory access, they provide mentorship, and they provide uh, collaborations. So uh, scientists are also collaborating when we have these partnerships. So it's not just, oh, SOARS by itself, but partnerships are formed and collaborations are started and continued. In fact, many mentors in labs often write SOARS protégés and having a protégé into their proposal. And so we have a budget template so that people can use this budget template to actually write a source protege in terms of the cost for what it would be for one year. We also have academic partnerships in the form of satellites. So currently in this award, we're funded by NSF as a core, but again, we receive funding from other places. Uh, we have two source satellites, and right now, each satellite basically takes the components of SOARS and applies it to their unique situation. One of the um, satellites is at the University of Central Florida, and it is run by a SOARS alumni who is in the Department of Engineering, Civil, Environmental, and Construction Engineering. Um, they provide research opportunities throughout the year and um, also provide mentoring to the um, student. Right now, we are trying to also request funding so that they are able to come to the end-of-year colloquium that SOARS has in the summer, as well as participate in a conference where the co-PI and the student also interact with the SOARS cohort. The other satellite is at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, also led by a SOARS alumni who is an assistant professor, and she is actually in the Department of Atmospheric Science at the university. Um, she also has a student who um, is getting in her research group and getting year-round mentoring. Students are also getting funding to um, be paid for the research opportunities during the year. So with the government organizations, uh, we collaborate with NSF, that is our main funder, our core funder, and has been, as I mentioned before. We also collaborate with NOAA. Uh, we have a partnership with NOAA's collaboration program, the Science Collaboration Program. They fund four students um, last summer, and they will be funding four students this summer, really through their climate program office. And uh, we can determine pretty much where in NOAA that they can be um, seated and with whom. So we had two students in space weather last summer and two students working with Ceres. We also had funding from a grant called INCLUDES, which is about Western um, science practices with Native science practices in trying to encourage um, the collaboration amongst Native and American and tribal college students. Um, so we did have an, another student. She was placed at NOAA and who was uh, part of the INCLUDES funding. We have other geoscience partners such as ourselves. 
in CAR and UCAR. Uh, we've had uh, students pretty much participate in all of the labs. We are looking to um, have more uh, representation from um, ACOM or SIZZLE or um, EOL, as well as we've had with HAO and MQ and all of the labs. I can't all know all the acronyms. But <laughs> um, it is a really great way for the program to be integrated throughout the enterprise and to um, get to learn more about the various labs and the types of research that is done, which I think aids in making it a more integrative process and breaking down the silos. Um, SOARS is a part of uh, UCAR community programs and sits in science education, science. So it's UCP, well, it's UCAR, and then it's U UCP, and then it's SIED. So that's where we are currently housed. We also work with um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, or HUI. Students, um, in some cases, have the opportunity to come to SOARS for their first incoming year, where they're getting you know, research experience and also professional development, uh, writing workshop, as well as a computing workshop but then also have the opportunity to work remotely. For instance, in the partnership with Woods Hole, you can come to SOARS for your first year, and then if you have a mentor or want to complete uh, research in another institution, you have that opportunity if you have a mentor at that institution. Um, that way, we would also pay for that collaboration as well, and then they would come and present their research at the end of summer. And th these are partnerships that we're also trying to um, create more of, which hopefully will include Brookhaven as well as other national laboratories. I think that the model that we have here is, is applicable to other national labs. Okay. So for the pathways, we, um, as a program, have had over 215 uh, alumni come through the program, and they are represented in all areas of the geoscience community, including in academia. We have students who are professors, who are uh, assistant professors and long-term professors um, in, at various institutions like University of Arizona, Chris Castro, or, you know, Penn State, um, CSU, all over, as well as also in government in NOAA. They're um, occupying leadership roles, and also I'm trying to uh, write a paper about the impact that the program has had on the alumni in terms of how they mentor and how they uh, multiply that effect by mentoring, um, as well as the private sector as well. We have examples of all of these uh, SOARS alumni, I believe, are on all leadership councils. There's one SOARS alumni at AMS. So in every area of leadership at AMS, there sit uh, alumni. So we're do trying to do a better job of tracking where people are if they decided to stay into the geosciences community and how this experience has helped them um, maintain their status and um, motivation to be in this community. So the community is a part of the three pillars of the um, SOARS program along with research and mentoring. So those are the three strands of the program that, you know, in, inspire people, want ask people to, you know, stay involved. And the SOARS alumni are very connected still. I've never really actually seen any kind of uh, alumni group that is this connected. I think their shared experience when coming for an 11-week program is just very, you know, rigorous and um, time consuming. They're spending a lot of time together, but they're also spending an average of, you know, a 40 hour work week doing research, but also um, building skills. And I think that the cohort building is as important as mentoring. Um, and that's all I have to say. Do you have any questions? Oh, and of course, I have to make my pitch for mentors. Uh, so SOARS is an 11-week program, and students come, and basically there's a, uh, an orientation week when they come in the summer, and uh, included in that week is one day at the lab. So matching happens prior to their arrival with the labs, and 
you know, we need mentors all the time. So we're always recruiting mentors. I've recruited a few mentors on the shuttle, in fact. Um, yes, yeah, so we will be having two open houses, one at Mesa Lab and one in Foothills in February, I think the 10th and the 21st just so you know, and we will be putting out the calls for mentors because the mentoring model, which is unique really to SOARS, is, is, is very comprehensive. Each student gets a research mentor or mentors. Some, some are mentored by a team. Um, in Scott Sewell's case, he had three other students or postdocs mentoring his student, and he was also in an internship team. Um, they also get a writing mentor, typically not inside their same lab so that, that the writing makes sense to and familiarize with the science audience, but not necessarily the audience that is from their lab. Um, if you're new or incoming, you also get a community coach, which could be from a different lab as well, just really checking in on the atmosphere and the temperature and the pulse of the students because this is a new environment for most. Most students don't have the type of research experience that this enterprise holds and it's a learning experience for everyone. Additionally, students get a computation coach if in fact their research project requires Python or MATLAB or ArcGIS. It depends on what the project is and um, if the student needs additional computation, they do get a coach. Uh, they also get a peer mentor if you're incoming. So that means a returning uh, protégés uh, provide peer experiences for the students in terms of having someone on their level to ask questions, to lean on, to um, understand the situations, etc. And we are planning to formalize training for peers so that, you know, students feel that they have support and resources to mentor each other. Um, this is extremely important when it comes to applying for graduate school or other programs or, you know, building your network for this community. Um, so my pitch for mentoring, we will be asking, I'm going to ask you <laughs> all the time um, if you would consider being a mentor. And note that research mentor is a very um, time committed position. We ask or give guidelines that it's like 10 hours per week, but that's not the only mentor that you can do. You can be a writing mentor, you can be a community coach, you can be a computation mentor. So if you, you know, have not as much time in the summer, you know, where you would think that you might not want to commit to being a research mentor, there are other mentors to consider. And if you have questions about mentoring, et cetera, we're trying to also offer some mentor training this summer or this spring so that people feel that if they want to, they can learn a little bit more about mentoring and mentoring to historically underrepresented communities in STEM. Um, if you had some other questions, I'm sure Sarah wouldn't mind um, giving her perspective on mentoring. I don't know. The other uh, benefit, I would say, of the program is that students also get conference travel as a part of their um, funding. So conference travel to one conference of their choice, um, if it can be international, but we ask that the mentor is presenting as well for an international conference. We did have a student go to the conference in Amsterdam 
um, in October um, to present, I believe he was doing machine learning as well with Noah, Pedro. Um, and also the fact that there's support for GREs. Now, many universities are stepping back in terms of requiring that, but we do offer GRE prep as well as tuition funding, so last dollar amount for undergraduate and graduate students. And so I think that that is a very good incentive for students trying to continue on that path towards um, being in the sciences and being particularly in geosciences. So there's a lot of opportunity and support and concrete support for students. So just wanted to put that out there. And thank you so much. That was a very good summary. Yes. Okay, sure. Um, so the application is open right now and it closes on the 1st of February. However, because of the earthquake in Puerto Rico and I was approached by Puerto Rico students at AMS, I will probably keep the application open a little bit longer for Puerto Rican applicants. Um, the application requires two essays that deal with leadership and diversity, uh, two recommendations from professors, uh, official transcripts, and we also have a form in terms of what area you'd like to um, research. Um, the matching happens after a long, lengthy process of meeting with the steering committee, who basically there's a member from each lab um, on this committee uh, discussing in detail. Uh, we've been in tier the applications. So for last summer, for instance, there were 105 applications. We had eight open slots. Because the program um, is for returning protégés, we, we have to determine how many students are coming back before we know how many slots we will have for this summer. So last summer, it was eight slots for incoming. So it's extremely competitive. Um, once protégés are identified, and you know, there's also an interview process to make sure that this is something that they would like to do and com fully commit to, there's a contract, of course. Um, we talk about, with the steering committee as well, the types of area of research. So if we have proposals and um, ideas of who's going to mentor, mentors submit research designs. And so we know, for instance, that this person's going to work on orographic precipitation. Who's going to be interested in that? That person may have had a physics background and is interested in, in cloud seeding, et cetera. So that's how we try to match. We match with their transcripts. We match with their area of interest in their essays, really, on what it is that they'd like to research. Now, when you return, you have more of an onus to pick the type of research that you'd like to do, as well as choose your mentors. So we give that responsibility to returning protégés. undergrad it depends it depends right they're not going to have as much depending on the math and science that they've had but they have the interest this the the program is to have exposure in stem most people are not having any exposure to research in undergrad. So this is the opportunity to learn. There's no um, there's no minimum level qualification in terms of um, you have to be a junior or a rising sophomore. No. That would limit the access, I think. Yes.
Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes, the Friday, uh, the the Friday is basically designed around professional development, but it's mainly the writing workshop. So the writing workshop goes, you know, through the different phases as well as computation workshop, depending on where the level of exposure the students are in. So they're doing Python, they're doing MATLAB. It just depends on what additional things that they need. Um, the professional development has ranged, at least last summer, including tours. So we went to NOAA, of course, to do a tour. We went to Cheyenne, as you saw in the picture, to see the supercomputer. Uh, we also had um, discussions and talks around posters and um, how to put them together, but also, you know, what it's like that protégés led in terms of applying to graduate school and what those uh, components mean and what you'll need, et cetera, things like that. That's typical, but there are students who want to have a different experience. So a student had, a, I think, uh, an experience in uh, co Comet or Cosmic and then wanted to do space weather. So then had to get, we had to find matches at NOAA. It depends. If you want to have an ongoing project or have a project that's multi-year, then that's something that you can discuss with the the protege in uh, Sarah's case, I believe you all discussed that he wants to continue in his. Right. And I think a common occurrence is long-term relationships that are built with the mentors and the protégés, um, which, of course, is helpful for, you know, I think mutual benefit. Uh, professors and scientists are getting, you know, the enthusiasm in the work as well. And this, the students are getting, you know, examples and access as well as um, recommendations and you know, guidance when it comes to their pathway. Yes. 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 Or two, depending on how many uh, protégés you'd like. Right.
there are some uh, thoughts and considerations being made at that level. Um, there is an MSI engagement strategy as well to supplement what is happening. The director of NCAR is interested in working with us with our database for jobs that open up that students could then be, alumni could then be uh, contacted to see if they're interested. Um, I think that it's a multi-level strategy in terms of um, having an inclusive environment here in Boulder, much less at an NCAR. So those are things that, you know, have to be taken into consideration. I think that recruiters are now getting it um, that, you know, Work is not 24-7, right? Your environment is also important, so welcoming a welcoming environment is also helpful. So I think that that's a very good way to maybe make the pipeline, but, um, you know, there has to be something done at the early career scientist level. I mean, to attract and to compete. Right. Yeah, definitely. 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 Uh, the undergraduates come to know about it, but we advertise. So we advertise at labs, we advertise at universities, we advertise at organizations that um, interact with uh, universities. We go to conferences. That's one of our main recruiting um, avenues. So I've been to uh, SACNIS as well as AGU and, and AMS most recently. Any other questions? Nope. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about SOARS. Feel free to reach out. Um, in FL2, I'm on the UCAR staff, so definitely if you have questions, um, we will be making the call again for mentors and, um, you know, opportunities to promote the projects. Uh, one of the things that is helpful and I think would be a better recruitment tool is to understand what the projects are prior. So when I speak to students, I can say, hi, I have a, a project that involves severe weather, which is a major thing that students want. And I can't compete with Oklahoma's REU <laughs> when they want to do severe weather. But if you have something that's both, and then, you know, I've been approached by various field campaign teams um, to maybe design a professional development for our students this summer. There's a field campaign, the C-130 in Borealis, um, this summer. So hopefully we'll have opportunities that way. But really, students talk to each other, and it's word of mouth. And it's a very competitive program because of the number of people that apply for this, such a few slots. And so, you know, hopefully... You know, the access is one thing. I mean, you don't have to be the top in your class to be, you know, uh, a part of the program. I think that that limits access. And so, you know, we're very open about, you know, potential as well as willingness and motivation for leadership. All right. Thank you so much.